You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Patrick Tonowski, who is the founder of PTX2 Healthcare Consulting. Welcome to the show, Pat. Thanks, Dr. Roxy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, you bring a very unique experience uh, to this conversation. Uh, you know, we have healthcare leaders that have been on the show and we have advisors and consultants, um, but not, I think, uh, no one that is well versed in the healthcare leadership ecosystem that has now become a consultant. And so then to be able to bridge those insights, I think is just going to make for a very powerful conversation today. Yeah, I think so as well. I've been so fortunate to be able to really live and work for 30 years in every part of the healthcare ecosystem, like you mentioned. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. So, so let's go there. Tell yeah. our audience a little bit about your background and experience and then, um, you know, what you're working on these days. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, yeah, I started off in the provider space. So I'm a physical therapist and um, really loved what we're doing with our patients. Uh, did that for about 10 years and did a lot of teaching, uh, both continuing ed and, and academic appointments uh, at a few universities. Absolutely loved it, but just got a bit pooped with the day-to-day patient care and um, uh, really realized that I still want to stay involved and, and found a bit of a penchant for the business of our business. So I, I took a bit of a left turn at that time in, in, in a healthcare career and did an MBA and spent uh, moved into medical devices and spent seven years there working um, with a uh, one of the largest medical device companies at that time, then it was uh, pretty exclusive to orthopedic surgery and uh, rehabilitation. And younger company, we were private. We were taken, uh, a republic. We were taken private by a, a large private equity firm. So I got to, it was my first exposure into what private equity looks like. Um, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly with it, but mostly, <laughs> mostly good. Yeah. And uh, you know, in that experience, got to touch an awful lot of parts of, of the organization, uh, whether it was from quality to sales to marketing to uh, product development and research working with our national accounts, payers, um, doing advocacy work in, in, um, in Washington, D.C. and at a state level, and absolutely loved it. It couldn't have been a better learning lab for the time of doing an MBA as well. Right. Um, you know, but I was traveling a bunch. My kids were young, and it just didn't make sense to stay on the road. So I was um, uh, fortunate enough to be a co-founder of, um, of a occupational medicine practice here in the Twin Cities. And um, we had great success. We scaled quickly and uh, exited from there. And 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 was invited to join the one of the largest health systems here in, in Minnesota to lead. This is really in the early days of the development of clinical service lines. So the dyad leadership model with physicians. Um, and we were, was fortunate enough to be able to work with an incredible team of, of leaders, physicians, uh, administrators that were really dedicated to this concept of how do we create an exceptional experience that is consistent, that is affordable, evidence-based across multiple providers and multiple geographies. And we had really, really good success with that. So it was a, just an amazing opportunity. So the um, early stages of centers of excellence, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Conceptually like that. And then how do we, how do we take what's, what's, you know, at the core of a center of excellence and scale that mm-hmm. into multiple geographies and some of the really, I think kind of unique challenges to that. There's certainly the administrative side that says, let's, we can get system advantages and, you know, some of the, the, um, uh, economies of scale, but but what became really interesting and, and informed an awful lot of the work I'm doing today was branching into the more rural communities and understanding the unique and important position that rural providers and rural hospitals have in their communities. You know, mm-hmm. unlike what we see in some of the the, the more uh, urban uh, environments. In, where there may be multiple systems, multiple hospitals, when you get into a more uh, uh, rural community, that hospital and that clinic and that small nursing home are really the fabric of that community. Mm-hmm. And so we realized that we could bring out a, a, you know, here's sort of the package for clinical consistency and, and such in a clinical service line, um, but it didn't always fit. You know, maybe 80% of that would fit, but 20%, we need to respect that, which makes, you know, that uh, that clinic, that hospital yeah. unique to that community. And that was a great learning and great opportunity um, 
So after after that, I spent a few years with a with a venture group creating uh, spinning up one of their portfolio companies dedicated to musculoskeletal care, which is certainly uh, certainly a, a very hot segment and expensive segment. And then uh, 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 multiple years with another health plan, uh, where I was uh, fortunate enough to lead a digital health portfolio. All of the products that we uh, we would choose to bring in that we would then bring to our self-insured and sometimes the fully insured and sometimes the, the government markets. Um, and it was just an amazing time at the explosion of all of this digital care to be on the buyer side of that and mm-hmm. understand the things that are really important, not only to the to the health plan, but also to the to the employer partners that we have and ultimately to our members. What years um, were that? Uh, that would have been... Um, Gosh, starting about 2017, up until okay. about a year ago. Yeah. And so really, as I said, the explosion of the digital health uh, and then uh, layering on a pandemic where, where not only did, did the, the number of technologies coming to market increase, but so too did the adoption. And, and so from the health plan, we, there was really some, some unique opportunities and unique challenges there as well. You know, how do, mm-hmm. we, how do we vet these for safety and security? How are they going to fit into a provider, provider community? How will they fly with our members? How, and how, now that our, uh, most of the employers uh, are remote, you know, there's both opportunity and challenges there. Definitely. So all, you know, all of those things were, were very formative and left there about a year ago and um, uh, uh, began getting calls from founders um, saying, boy, you've, you've been in these different, this, the whole ecosystem. Most recently, you, you know, as I mentioned, you were a buyer at a health plan and, and we would love to work into a health plan. We would love to work with employers. Can you help us understand how they, how this works, how they think? Yeah. And what I have so enjoyed is working with founders, whether they're, they're early in their career or, you know, this is their second or third founding who, who see the opportunity for disruption uh, in healthcare and the opportunity for improving care delivery, but they just might not understand the, the sort of underbelly of how healthcare works or doesn't work or the, the complexities of it. So being able to help advise, inform, guide, um, and do an awful lot of customer discovery has just been a, has been such a pleasure. That is remarkable. So is there anything that you haven't done? <laughs> and how many careers have you had in one lifetime? <laughs> yeah, let's say all of them. All of them. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, and you're, you're not just nationally based. You're doing some work um, globally as well. Correct. Yeah, I, uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, clients from the Middle East, um, uh, from the UK, from Canada, who have, again, unique needs. Um, exceptionally smart people, great technologies who are, what I have appreciated about all of them is they're willing to say, I don't quite understand the the US market. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so enamored with my technology that I'm forgetting about the workflow with providers or the the experience of the of the end user, the member. Well, the patient, where are those people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those people, yeah, we have to remember them. So, <laughs> so I've really appreciated uh, appreciated working with folks who are who are open to those kinds of conversations and realize that um, they di- they they don't know when they need some help understanding it. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then let's go back to the, the, um, the lens of you being on the other side. Uh, you know, it's, it's really not that long ago that you were on the buyer side. Right. And a, at least I think half of our audience here is, is trying to sell into a provider market or a hospital system or a, a health plan. So what are some of the um, challenges or um, opportunities that you um, would want to share? with the community today? Yeah, that's, that's such an important question. Um, the opportunities are great in that we, when we just, when we look at the, the spend in healthcare, it continues to go up. You know, we have, we have pockets of, of uh, whether it's disease management or, or experiences, pockets in the, in the, in the different geographies where there's been good success, but mm-hmm. in aggregate, we, we still see that there's great opportunity to change the way care is delivered to reduce cost and improve quality. Um, so, so while there's great opportunity in a lot of lives that we just, we simply can't touch today. I mentioned the rural health markets before we look at, at um, just whether it's socially or economically disadvantaged uh, communities who, who were, were just not serving well, there's amazing opportunity there. The, 
uh, I think the pandemic, and I've heard so many times other uh, experts on this um, on your on your show talk about how the pandemic sort of pulled back the curtain and said, "Boy, there's opportunity here for for digital care." Mm-hmm. So we we see all of these these I think avenues for growth and avenue for uh, accessing and and bringing more care, different care, virtual care to uh, to different lives. Some of the challenges, though, that I think um, I have. I've been able to share with with many of the, the clients that I'm working with and, and you know these founders is one let's just understand it's a long sales cycle and and I think folks hear that but um, we'd say I know I can save money I've done my pilot work and I I've got I've got a few clinical studies that show that it has an impact and while someone comes into the to a, a payer with that data we'd say well that that's great but we need to validate that with our own data so that slows things down we need to understand um, how does it fit? Because I, as I mentioned, I, I had a full portfolio of products and bringing something new into that, I need to understand how how would it complement or potentially collide with something that I currently have. And for me, yeah. if there's if there's a opportunity for it to be additive, I still need to be thinking, you know, the sales cycle is so long. I need to be thinking for the next two and a half years, you know? So by the time I've made my decision, I'm selling for probably two years ahead. So those are some of the things that I think um, have been interesting say, for these founders. When you say selling two years ahead, you're not talking about as the founder, you're talking about as the buyer. So as the buyer, you made the decision that you're going Correct. to buy and, and it's still going to take you two and a half years, two to two and a half years to sell. So do you mean like um, selling the other leaders within the company, the other departments? No, no. Yeah, that's uh, important, important distinction. So yes, there's uh, as with any, as with enter- enterprise sale, it's how do we align and and create mm-hmm. find the resources mm-hmm. internally and get those levels of approval. Um, but when we look at if if so much of the market that we're bringing these solutions to is the self insured employer, you know, let's say because the health plans in that case are acting essentially as a reseller, even though yep. there may be provider mm-hmm. contracts or uh, however we're, we're this, however the reimbursement is working. Um, my so. We're right. We're we're recording this in November, so all of all of 2021 is sold. It's in the can. It's in the books. And for many of the the large employers, the national accounts, jumbos, whatever terminology we want to use, those decisions are typically made in February or March. Right. For yep. the for the next calendar year, and that means I, as a buyer, need to have had contracting done. Um, uh, and filings into state plans by probably August of the previous year, which means I probably started this RFP and and review and negotiations even the year before that. So that's some of the complexity. And I think when when we start talking about that with founders who say, you know, I've got I've got my seed money, I've I've maybe you know I've raised some dollars, and we say, boy, it's gonna it's gonna take you a couple of years to probably get. A first client. Now, there there are some some health plans that will say, "Yep, I need it. I want it. You're you're filling a huge need, and let's go fast." But for the majority, it's a slower process. And I think some of the founders are saying, Oof, "I didn't know that." Yeah, so I, I need yeah. to better understand that. And maybe there are some other avenues that we can take along the way to uh, show show adoption that would make um, investors happy. And I, I think just even the term fast is really relative. It's very, su- very subjective, <laughs> yeah, right? right? So right. their their perception of fast, I need this fast, I need this now is very different. I think probably, you know, than a lot of these startup uh, in, inventors and entrepreneurs. Yeah. So, um, so what, so some of the challenge is the funding, right? So um, is it a different conversation with those investors? Is it a different type of pitch deck? to set the expectations of the amount of resources that are really needed to, um, you know, be able to build a company around this new idea um, because you're going to need resources for so long. How, how are they getting uh, um, investors to support that? Oh yeah. You're not going to have cash flow for three years. Yeah. I, I, I believe uh, what what I'm seeing, what I advise um, is just that. Let's let's be very upfront with the investors. Yeah. Um, and I know for and and I'm not. That's not an area of of great expertise for me. So there may be some others that would that will counter this and say, no, here's the, here's the better path. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always been a believer in saying and just being very very transparent with 
mm-hmm. whomever is investing that we've got an idea, we've validated it, we're working through this, these processes. Um, if our channel is with an employer, I'm sorry, with a, a health plan, and then ultimately to the employer, it's going to take us time to get there. So I think being upfront with that, um, yeah. seem, it seems to me, you know, I, I just always deferred to the, let's, let's be realistic and honest about it. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. otherwise I think we have investors coming back to founders and, and just being very upset and, you know, dissatisfied. And that leads to more tension within the organization. And perhaps we, you know, th- those organizations are making poor decisions as a result. Yeah. And, and great ideas in the zombie graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not because it was terrible technology. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, you know, as you are working with innovators who are figuring out their business model, um, is there a particular payer? And I don't mean it like a managed care organization, but is there a particular payer where you're saying that th- if you can figure out a business model for this target market, you're going to be better suited <laughs> than trying to sell into this because, you know, you've just saved yourself 18 months of, of, of sales cycle here. Um, you know, is there any learnings around that that might be yeah. useful for the community? Yeah, yeah, I, I think there are. Um... And there's, there's probably a few different ways to, to look at that. Yes, understanding the unique needs of a payer, because once you've, once you've sort of made inroads or made connections or understand one payer, you have understood one payer. Yeah. Everybody okay. has their unique needs. Um, and, and so understanding what their drivers are, what are their key initiatives? Um, how are you fitting into uh, uh, DEI initiatives or, or whatever, you know, whatever those, those are? And what needs do they have? So that, that's one piece of it. The other piece that I think has to happen before that is for these founders to really understand their product and what, not only from a tech perspective and care delivery perspective, but what problem are you solving? Mm-hmm. Because what, and sort of my mantra has always been, I'll take the call. If someone wants to talk to me, you know, when I was either the buyer or today, I'll always talk with them and let, let's just see. And being very honest on, hey, this makes sense, or you're not ready yet because of this. Yep. Um, and oftentimes, what I what I discovered was that they weren't ready because they didn't quite understand the problem. They they hadn't done the homework. They hadn't done the discovery work to talk to to the potential buyers, the customers and not even sell their product. Don't go in to sell, go in to say, I have a hypothesis. Help me understand if I got it right or wrong. Tell yeah. me about your day-to-day. Um, in fact, we were just uh, doing that this morning mm-hmm. with a uh, with a client. Um, it's got a really, really, really um, uh, impressive idea around senior preventive care. Fascinating and, and if, uh, if they could, I, I believe if they can find the right clients or the right uh, buyer, they will have great success in reducing hospitalizations. But the yesterday we were we were talking with a with a buyer and administrator in in um, a certain uh, segment who said, "I'm not sure you're, you're going to like what I'm going to tell you." And you know, we, we say in Minnesota, sort of a Minnesota nice thing, right? And we said, no, you know, feel free to tell us that the, the baby is not the best looking one here. Tell yep, us yep. so we can avoid mistakes. And then today we spoke with a, with a physician uh, in a different part of the country who said, I think, I think people like me would be all over this. We would love this. So it's that sort of thing. But we, what we're learning in this discovery is not just walking in with a, I can fix it all, but Here's, I understand you. I, I understand you. I understand your problem. I understand um, where I can fit. And I understand the, the, the real challenges that, uh, that you have. So that's, I think, I think that's an important piece to be more successful in targeting the, the health plans is coming in with a really focused and you understand not only your business model, your finances, your technology, but you understand the solution and what's, what solution, or I'm sorry, what problem that solution is solving. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously that's very critical, really, no matter what market segment yeah, you're yeah. wanting to. Yeah. Just... That's not a new concept, but it's right. surprising to me <laughs> no. how, how we tend to forget that too often. Yeah. I, th- I think there ends up being a lot of ego um, and a lot of biases that are woven in to, to the fabric of this initiative that become really just difficult. Um, just a lot of emotional investment 
in, yeah. in the idea, in the technology, in the pathway um, and that gets really difficult to kind of unravel. Um, in, yeah. And, and I also find that founders really want to move fast. And, and so there's this perception and, and the reality that customer discovery, you know, slows things down. Yeah, I, and it could, but it doesn't have to. You can do a very rapid customer discovery. And uh, the process that, that, that I use is really based on, I was, I was fortunate enough uh, a few years ago to be part of the National Science Foundation in their, their i program. And I know many of the folks on that listen to your show have, have referenced that. And you know the, the old adage there is get out of the building, go talk yeah. to people. Yeah. And it is, it is so much fun to talk with folks from all over the country. And we're not, you know, the, we, we'd say we're not here to sell anything. We're just here to pick your brain. Yeah. Talk about, talk about you, talk about your, your, your environment, talk about what keeps you up at night. And, um, you know, if, if you were on the other side of this conversation, what do you think would be really important for us to know? Yeah. So, so that can move really quickly, um, versus some of the more, I'd say more traditional expensive 12 month, let's go explore a market. I think you can do those things very quickly. And, and with a, with a, um, get meaningful information from a relatively small sample size. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360-degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. So let's, let's talk about that. I want to kind of dig in the weeds a little bit because Mm -hmm. um, I I think that such a valuable conversation. So we've, let's say we've convinced folks that you need to do customer discovery. So some of the the roadblocks that I um, have witnessed and have heard about um, um, is, is recruiting it, you know, depending on who they're trying to get to sit down and give them 20 minutes of their time. A lot of times it's right. more of these SVPs or the C-suite um, that they're selling to maybe or physician providers that are going to be the users in this. And so getting access or recruiting them for those one-on-one conversations or, you know, those face-to-face encounters is 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 really a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some of your recommendations for being able to overcome some of that? Well, I would I would challenge the assumption that the that the right that the right level of discovery is the C suite. Okay. Yep. Because let let's 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 envision that we're we're found well we are founders but let's envision we've got a product today and and we it will solve this particular problem in healthcare. Mm-hmm. If we go to the C suite, that that population has you know. 8,000 things on their plate right now that they're, that they're thinking about worrying about future state, current state, all of those, all of those uh, areas that are, you know, inherent to that position. Are they going to be the users of the product? Will they be able to really help you solve and understand the, the day-to-day ecosystem? Yeah. And oftentimes not, I mean, they're just, they, they just might not be connected to that frontline work that needs to be done. Yeah. So going, yeah, going to that level, to me, that almost feels more like a sale than it does a discovery. Mm-hmm. So if we can get to a to a front front line, um, and this part of the discovery is, you know, what what's, who is the buyer? We start with we think it's we think it's this. And another adage from the from the National Science Foundation is, you know, buildings don't buy don't, don't buy products. Right. People logos do. don't either, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It's nice to put a logo on your site, you know, your website, and say that they're a customer, but the logo isn't buying. It's an, it's a it's a person. So who is that person? What is their title? And then understand what's important to, to them. If you figure that out, oftentimes in part of that discovery, they will say, oh yeah, I mean, if, if you're on, 
and someone says their you know their eyes light up and say I'm buying today good who do I need to talk to now right well right. let me walk this down the hall to so and so so you know I think that you know just challenge the assumption that we need to start at the C-suite or with the key opinion leaders because they get the pitches all the time and um, and I'm not sure that you, that founders would necessarily learn what they need to at that level yeah yeah. I think that's a, a really valid point. The other one that I hear a lot about is compensation. So am I, you know, expecting folks to be able to have these conversations for free? Do what kind of budget do I need to have allocated for this? Um, sample size, how many people do I need to have these conversations with until I get some kind of statistical significant um, learnings that I can kind of make informed decisions on? Yeah. Um Sample size, you know, generally the more the better, right? Because if you if you talk with 10 people, you're probably gonna get, unless you are so totally dialed in, you're gonna get eight different responses. Yeah. Which at that point, you may have just figured out the the discovery process. You might have figured out, oh, we're asking the wrong question. So more is better, but not everybody can afford more. Sure. Um in in mm-hmm. my experience in this discovery process, we're asking people for 15 minutes. This mm-hmm. isn't a sit down, give me two hours. Right. So, it, and, and I think we're, again, it, as we become a much more virtual uh, society, it's okay. In, in, back in, in, you know, pre pandemic, pre virtual, ideally it was great to sit down face to face with you. And so there's travel expenses and all of those sorts of things. Yep. But now we can do it here. We can do it when someone's sitting in their car. Uh, it's good to have some, to have a face or a face to face, at least virtually, because then we can, we can watch your pupils you know, and say, wow, you're onto something. Or we see the nonverbals that give you the, you know, <laughs> right, right. I don't know where you're going with this, but we can say just that. Yeah. I, I see yeah. that this, you know, this mm-hmm. doesn't seem to resonate. So it, it, I think from a, from a budget perspective, it's more about, it's the time to do it, but to find 15 minutes with folks, I've just found people to be very, very willing to talk for 15 minutes. Yeah. And you can yeah. learn a lot in 15 minutes with somebody. If you're, if you're targeted in, in the questions and, you know, it's not rambling, rambling, just be very respectful of their time. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that it's worth it. it. It's, it's the, their entire business is really reliant upon the foundation, um, yeah, yes. right? These, these decisions that are being made based upon so many different assumptions. And so if it takes you an extra $10,000, if it takes you an extra 60 days to actually have some validated um, assumptions um, or vi- validated hypotheses that then you're building all of your other resources around. Right. I mean, ha- <laughs> that's just a no-brainer. Yeah, that seems like it's the ounce of prevention you know, concept. Yeah. And and <laughs> I, I, it, it was just even this morning, I was talking with a, with a, a founder and his co-founder, um, potential potential we could do some work together, but we spoke three weeks ago, just an intro call. And um, as they were explaining what they were trying to do, they, they could see my nonverbals because I did give them the, you know, the <laughs> eyebrow went up and, eyebrow. I, I, yeah, and I started to sit back from the screen and, um, and we chatted again today and they said, here's what we've learned. Cause I'd given them, you know, just a couple of suggestions and they said today, here's what we've learned. We've gone from a boil the ocean strategy to this. And it, it at least on the surface looks to be elegant and, and solving a, a big problem. Yeah. Um, so it was just so exciting to see folks mm-hmm. take that on. And what did it cost them? Three weeks and 20 <laughs> phone calls and probably 50 hours of reading. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and I want to like have a conversation around that boil the ocean. Um, you know, I think that's another challenge that so many founders are facing when they really are onto something like it's very common that there is a problem that's pervasive and, mm-hmm. and maybe it's other markets besides healthcare, or maybe it's just many, many sectors within healthcare <laughs> that they could sell to um, or many variations of that product. And, and sometimes, you know, I think they're just thinking that bigger is better. 
And mm. so if I'm, you know, oh, I've got 10 markets and three products, like that's so much better than one market and one product. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's not to say that you can't have that big grand vision, but you got to start somewhere. Right. And I think it's yeah. always it's very often alarming um, when someone's trying to boil the ocean. Yeah, it again, it's it's really um, it's really attractive. When you I mean how how many times have have you heard from people, you know the 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 TAM the total address, addressable market is you know billions of dollars and if we can just get two percent of that we're going to be great <laughs> exactly and it's like, and run. you're right your, your your math is right but let's talk about what it what would it actually take to get there and well what if yeah. it's half of that and 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 mm-hmm. How do we, how do, I think there's great value in narrowing it down. Let's, let's prove our concept. Let's prove our technology. Let's prove the value. However, we define value, you know, whether it's a, an improvement in cost or safety or, or security or uh, engagement, uh, whatever it would be, let's demonstrate that there's value. And that becomes a much, I think that's a story that that would resonate with me uh, as a buyer, much more than I can fix all of your problems. You know, so let's come in with with a target, and and that actually lends itself to, and you know, the, the, there's the old adage, you know, the death by death by pilot, um, and the, the number of pilots that we do, but but I, I believe there there are willing providers, there are willing health plans, there are willing health systems to pilot something, and that's a lot easier when it's very targeted because then we can identify the patient population or the member uh, population or the employer employee population, whatever however we're segmenting those groups. Um, and not only identify them, but start to see, did we make a difference pre and post? Yeah. And if there's a difference, odds are that's going to lead to something, something bigger and better. Definitely. I, and I think the, the positioning and the messaging is so much easier when you're yeah. very narrowly focused, right? You can mm-hmm. really have a much stronger um, value proposition and positioning strategy than if you're trying to, you know, maybe be all things to all people. Right. Yeah. We, I recently worked with a, with a client that when we started some of this discovery and um, some other activity, we kind of heard, so I don't really get what it is that you do. <laughs> and, and then that has changed over the course of a couple of weeks to, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's just, it's the refining. And, and again, I think that's, that's the, it's the slow down to go fast kind of thing. Let's, yeah. let's learn quickly, yeah. but from there, it's not just not just learning, but now it's the application. You know, we talk about that with 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 patient care all of the time. We don't necessarily need more information as as healthcare consumers. We we have all sorts of ability to gain information. It's now how do I how do I activate? How do I use that information in a meaningful way? And that's the founders need to apply that to their own businesses. Uh, they need to apply that as we look at well, this is information that's going to be meaningful to the providers this will really change the provider's world. And when we actually sit with leaders or frontline providers, they say, I, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know how this information, how to use it. It's not necessarily actionable. It doesn't fit into my workflow. And I'm so busy today. I don't quite know how to apply those. Um, so, I mean, those are just the, the things that, that I think are so important for the founders to to spend a bit of time learning and understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and going into it with the mindset to seek understanding as opposed yeah. to validate what they already believe. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm on a mission to learn something new instead of I'm on a mission to confirm that all my ideas are correct. <laughs> right. And, and, and so, you know, we, we've seen over the years, those kinds of, those kinds of discovery mm-hmm. sessions where, when when a customer is saying, no, it's this and this, and you see a, a founder say, yeah, but no, but I think you got it. No, I don't think you're getting it. I don't think, you know, and so they're really trying to sell and, and you know, you just want to do the, hey, time out. Listen, this is what they're telling. It's okay. This is, this is what you need to hear. Yeah. But yeah. It, that's hard. It's really hard when you've, when you have put so much of yourself you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially into this. And then someone says, you don't have it quite right. That's really, really hard to hear. And it, yeah. it, unless you're, unless you take a very, you know, the approach you just mentioned, I'm, I'm here to, I'm here to learn. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, it, you know, I don't think that we can talk about that enough um, when it comes to entrepreneurs mm-hmm. is, is just shouting this from the rooftops because the sooner they um, like acquiesce to this strategy and this process, the sooner that they will be on their path to profit <laughs> versus I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to, you know, launch into the marketplace. Right, I've got a right, half right. a million or a million dollars invested, or maybe even more. Uh-huh. And I'm two or three years in, I, I kind of had some false positives with a few customers that bought. So it felt like I'm on the right track. <laughs> and I, now all of a sudden yep. I can't, I lost all my traction <laughs> yeah. and I can't, I'm stuck and I can't really grow what's happening here. And it's just because the whole house is built on the wrong foundation. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And it might not even be the wrong foundation. It just might be that that it's the right foundation, but it's just not executed correctly. True. Very true. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I just, I continue to be impressed by how amazingly smart, passionate, committed um, so many founders are and how how frankly courageous they are yeah. to say, we're going to go do this. I'm going to change and the world. I yeah. I yeah. Can. That's a <laughs> right. It's, it's a big leap. And I, I so appreciate their energy uh, along the way. Um, so yeah, it, it, and it might not be that the, the idea is completely wrong. It just oh, might absolutely. be that it's not, it's not executed. Right. But it might be that the idea is really wrong too. And yeah. let's learn that faster before there's a, a catastrophic mistake. And well, and you know what? I think sometimes the mindset is, is that, um, I don't know if I want to say something's wrong with me, but you know, like something's wrong with me. If I don't already have the answers, something's wrong with me. If I don't just know what path I need to go, um, or even thinking that this is like a startup issue. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, no matter what size company you are, no matter where you are in the product life cycle or in the company life cycle, um, you know, there's a book I read, um, called experimentation and it's just Mm -hmm. endless stories of even companies like Microsoft who, experiment and experiment and they change and they tweak and they conversate and all of these little things. And I mean, the change of one button, you know, was like $10 million, (laughs) you know? So it's, it's not something that just entrepreneurs have to do. It's just smart business for anyone today. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, you raised a point earlier on with it, it can be hard to do. And I think, Mm -hmm. especially in the the founder space, and and there was someone on your show uh, recently who was, uh, who was talking about, um, you know, we see these companies that were founded today and then in three years, their valuation is a gazillion dollars and such. But but she made such an important point when she said, no, we started our company 10 years ago. Right. And it wasn't really until we incorporated this way or became our S-corp or whatever it is, that's sort of like the official on paper date. Um, but what we tend to forget is there's been a long, a long lead up to that point. Yeah. And, and so... Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the founders oftentimes who just feel that they feel a bit exhausted or they feel that I, there must be something that that I'm doing wrong or yeah. or I'm not getting the traction that I want. Um, it's real. And, yeah. and, you know, I think they can get stuck sometimes by seeing these sometimes rocket ships um, <laughs> that are that, that, you know, we might not hear the whole story there. The full backstory. Well, you know, I think that's a big role that this show plays in the mm-hmm. I would agree. is, is, you know, for those folks that want to be honest and candid to come on, you know, to come on here and really be transparent about the realities of it. Um, you know, not because we want to be negative Nancy and doomsday here, but we just want to be real. So that way other folks are encouraged and not thinking that, oh, I just need to go A, B, C <laughs> and Eureka, <laughs> because it's just not realistic. Right, right. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you founded and done your own thing and you know that it's never, it's never linear, right? Um, it's not, it's not A to J, it's A to wherever, you know, it's A to Pluto and back, we're all over the place and, and the same boat here. You know, yeah. I, I'm learning every day, not only from my clients and from, uh, from um, customers, but I'm learning every day about how to, how to be a better founder, how to run a business differently. I've got such a amazingly supportive group of, of um, uh, peers that we can sit down and, and share stories with, you know, there's great learn, great readings, um, podcasts like this that are just filled with information about um, maybe not necessarily the how to, but here are, here are mistakes. Here's learnings along the way and let's share those. 
yeah, and let's just, you know, encourage each other. <laughs> it's some yeah. wisdom, but also some inspiration and some encouragement too. <laughs> right, right. Yes, exactly. There's this invaluable. Yeah, yeah. So so let's um, you know, talk about I want to kind of go back to um, you know, this business model and and kind of gleaning some of the insights that mm-hmm. you have. So knowing a lot of the complexities within the traditional healthcare ecosystem, I think you see a lot of uh innovators that mm-hmm. go direct are um going direct to consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, that I'm going to circumvent all that healthcare ecosystem hoopla, <laughs> and I'm just going to go direct to consumer. The hoopla. <laughs> <laughs> just going to go directly to the consumer, and life is going to be so much easier. Right. Um, are are you you know what kind of conversations are you having with founders like that that are kind of at that crossroad where they really could go direct to consumer or um, going more of the B two B route? Yeah. So, so my personal conversations with those folks is I'm not a direct to consumer expert. So yeah. I would be really cautious about taking advice for me on, on that strategy <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. because there are people much, much better uh, prepared to have that. Sure. But, but what some of the, the, the next part of the conversation uh, needs to be, well, let's understand why, what, what do you think that opportunity could be? Why, why would you make that decision? Is it because you haven't gotten traction in the more traditional <laughs> hoopla model as, right, as right, referenced. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it is it because you you can't get in the door? Is it that folks are just not understanding your model or or whatever it would be? Yeah. So let's let's understand why you're making that decision and have you have you have you been as efficient or effective as you could be on that on the traditional model? Um, if the answer there is yes, where we've exhausted it and we just aren't finding a way in, then let's look at it a little a little differently with, well, now how does your model need to change? Mm-hmm. Because on, on this side, the more traditional, you probably have things like, you know, you could be a provider, you know, payer contracts that you might have to look at. Um, you you may have um, different billing models, you know, a per member per month or based on a success fee or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And now that model is going to change in a direct consumer. And again, I, I can't speak to what it cost. Yeah, yeah. You know, your, your acquisition cost in a direct consumer could could be meaningfully different yeah, <laughs> versus over here. Um, yeah. So I think it, the, the conversation is really about, well, let's just understand the why. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have uh, previously worked with a, with a client that was trying to do both. We think we can do a medical a medical side and we can do a direct consumer that's you know, a click down in terms of cost and complexity and that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, kind of back to your point earlier, that's a really, really broad strategy and yeah. not, not unachievable, but it needs, it needs resources, both, you know, people and connections and, and financial to manage both of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think you go back to what we we're talking about earlier. It, it doesn't have to be either or, but it really should be either or to start yeah, <laughs> and yeah. gain some traction there. And then we can add that other layer into it. Otherwise you're resourced so thin. I think you, you know, end up not being successful in any yeah, path, right, um, right. you know, re- financial resources, but always uh, also just time and attention. Yeah. And I think we, 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 can get a, uh, a mile wide and inch deep. And that's really challenging to run. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some other things as we kind of just start to wrap up here? Cause mm-hmm. I feel like we really could talk for days. I could just, you know, you're just so easy to talk to and have such a wealth of knowledge. Um, what are some other things that you want to make sure that you share with the community, both those, you know, innovators that are corporate innovators um, as, as well as those more early stage startups. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things that um, that some of my I think that my clients have maybe been a little surprised about, especially those that are really early in or maybe are entering healthcare for the first time. Yeah, is um, uh, as we mentioned before, just not understanding the complexity and the interconnectedness, and you know how many times we say, well, because because this you know this one and this one and this one, and you know if you try to put it on a on a whiteboard somewhere, it just <laughs> it starts to look like a mess, um, but. But one of the other things is is being able to speak the language mm-hmm. and spending time with people who know the language, um, yeah. you know, because the the health plan is going to uh, talk about members, 
They're going to talk about their clients being the um, being the employers. Um, they're going to talk about their their government line of business and you know the, the different the different lines of business within the organization. If we're talking with providers, we're talking about patients and we're talking about workflow and we're talking about productivity and we're talking about moving into uh, value based models. And you know, I'm so overwhelmed with day to day. If we talk with health systems, it's a little different conversation. If we're talking about devices, it's a little different conversation. Or not maybe not conversation, the language is a bit different. Yeah, yeah. And and so I think for for founders that are moving across multiple parts of the of the healthcare ecosystem, spending a bit of time to just understand the things that are unique to each of those. And and again, 80% of your message might be just fine, but 20% probably needs to be unique to that individual market. And that's an area that, especially for folks who are new to healthcare, is, is a challenge. Um, and that can make a difference. I don't think we yeah. realize how many acronyms we have because oh we're gosh. so accustomed to speaking yeah. the language. There's, there's the military and then there's healthcare in terms of the acronyms. <laughs> right. And for those for those who have have kind of grown up in this and spent our, our whole our whole careers here, yeah. The acronyms are easy. You know, they right. just sort of they roll off our tongue and we and we get it. And yeah. There are times when we just say, well, because of this, but for someone who's new that has an amazing idea and mm-hmm. is passionate and could really disrupt and eliminate waste or whatever the, the, the focus area is, um, a little time there, I think, could just go a long way. Yeah, yeah. So I want to end on this question. Um, what is your outlook for 2022, right? We've had a really um, rough couple of years in some ways because of all the challenges from the pandemic. We've also had a lot of disruption and a lot of opportunity. So what are you most excited about in 2022 when it comes to healthcare innovation? Um, so I'll answer first. I still think we're, I, I still see that we've got, we're not out of a pandemic, we still have some meaningful things happening mm-hmm. and the providers that I, that I speak with are exhausted yeah. for all sorts, all sorts of reasons. And so we get that. So, so I think some innovation will still be tempered by the fact that we're, we're not, we're not done yet no, uh, we're not. with the pandemic. So that, that I would just caveat to everything yeah. that there's still yeah. some work to go, especially for the providers that are listening. Um, uh, you know, we, we hear you and we thank you for all the work that you're doing. Or the people We're, that just have COVID right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, where, where I'm very optimistic is um, that there's still amazing opportunity to disrupt, to change. Um, and where I get excited is when I talk with people that are seeing it's not just a technology but it's a technology and service. And I hear more folks talking about the importance of, of be moving beyond engagement to activation mm-hmm. into whatever it is. So I can get someone to download my app and use it or, or to, to download and, and turn it on and, and register, but are they actually going to use it? So it's this yeah. activation. And I see, I get excited when I see, see folks talking more and more or hear folks talking more and more about the, uh, the activation and the importance of, behavior and behavior change in what we're doing. So that that gets re- uh, really gets me excited uh, because I think there's amazing opportunity there. That's awesome. I mean, that's 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 the holy grail, right? We're really going to yeah. only transform healthcare until we have some behavioral change right. um, and, as a whole. And- yeah, the other the other piece that that gets me very excited is to hear more and more people talking about um, uh, let's remove the disconnections between whatever my technology is, the health plan, the employer, and the, and the provider. And, you know, again, that's, that's the other holy grail, if there is one, uh, if, if we can have two of them, that's <laughs> the other sitting one. sitting at the table at the <laughs> yeah. same time. We right. can only dream, Pat, we can only dream. <laughs> but I, but, but the conversation is, is different. You know, yeah. it, it just seems as though we're, we're recognizing that. And, and I think in the next couple of years, more and more employers that have really embraced the value of digital, uh, digital care will start to uh, push and demand that, um, that these, these services start to connect even more, even better than they do today. So that's really exciting because that, that conversation is on its way. Yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, I think that organizations are going to figure out that they have to play ball in order to maintain their presence, build a sustainable business um, that continuing in the silo uh, ecosystem is, is, will get 
we'll get rolled over by the right. Amazon care and the, you know, the yeah. Apple care and, um, you know, and, within- and by the consumers, I mean, the, the, the consumers, consumers are, right. yeah, right. They're, yeah. they're yeah. demanding that things be different, which <laughs> right. is, which is great. That's just great. And again, that's where I come back to with the founders looking at this environment and saying, we mm-hmm. can help, we can do this differently, but, yeah. but we can't just come in without understanding that ecosystem. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us today. I really appreciate it. How can folks get a hold of you if anybody wants to connect with you after the show? Yeah, best way to find me is on LinkedIn and all my contact information is there. Uh, I said earlier, I will always take the call. I love talking with folks. If someone just wants to pick up the phone, uh, email me uh, and say, can I bounce an idea off of you? 100%, please feel free to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.